Hey, everybody, and welcome to Socratic Med's 11th week of our 15-week MCAT supplement program. Uh, my name is Chris, and today we're going to be going over really quickly um, an overview of glycolysis, the pentose phosphate pathway, um, and then a little bit about fermentation. So this is going to be a really quick lecture today, um, and it's mostly just going to be a review. Um, but a little bit about Socratic Med before we start. We're a grassroots nonprofit uh, that provides sensible solutions to students with disparate medical school opportunities, um, which just means that we have a bunch of free resources for MCAT prep. Um, it's all free. You can find it all online. I have our Instagram handle, our YouTube page, um, website is socraticmed.net. Um, we have a group me, which is the main way that we communicate with students. And then at the very bottom of this page, there's a link tree that will um, link you to all of these links. Um, and we even do one on one tutoring sessions as well. Um, and on a more personal note, my name's Chris. I graduated from Stony Brook in May of 2019. Um, I finished a pre-med track with a BS in Applied Math and Statistics. I took the MCAT in April um, and I scored a 520, which was the 97th percentile. And I did get a perfect score on Psych and Soch. So my tutoring specialties are Biology, Psych and Sociology. Okay, so the first topic of the video is glycolysis. Um, since this is a 15 week supplement course, um, the best way for you to really uh, absorb this course is to do it with our other 15 week program. Um, so there is a pretty in depth lecture that I actually did for our last 15 week course in glycolysis. Um, so I'm just going to go over it briefly here because just keep in mind these supplement videos, um, you should be watching them uh, in conjunction with our last 15 week course as well. Um, so a quick intro to cellular respiration, excuse me. Uh, humans oxidize glucose from start to finish through glycolysis, the Krebs cycle, and the electron transport chain. So those are the three uh, processes in the human body that will generate ATP. Um, in the first two steps, not much ATP is produced directly. Uh, glycolysis produces two ATP per glucose molecule, and the Krebs cycle produces two ATP per glu glucose molecule. Um, so out of the three processes, those first two aren't great for producing ATP, but they do produce a lot of other things that are important for the ETC. So as glucose is oxidized throughout these processes, the electron carriers NAD plus and FAD are reduced to their high energy forms NADH and FADH2. Um, so their high energy forms, they're also referred to as reduced forms, um, and their job is just to carry energy throughout the different systems um, in the form of electrons. So NADH and FADH2 will later be used to supply electrons to the ETC to develop more ATP. So glycolysis um, also produces two NADH molecules per glucose as well. Um, and per each glucose molecule, which actually results in two spins of the Krebs cycle, um, because as we'll go over really quickly, once you get to the Krebs cycle, it's actually um, two, three carbon molecules. So we can spin it twice. Um, and we're going to produce six NADH and two FADH2 molecules. So these products feed into the electron transport chain where uh, 34 ATP are produced per original glucose molecule. So it's a lot more efficient in making ATP um, than the first two, than uh, the Krebs cycle and glycolysis. All right, so we'll start with a quick overview of glycolysis, and then we're just going to go through the steps pretty quickly. Um, so glycolysis is highly conserved throughout all domains of life. Um, any type of life that you're going to look at, they're going to perform glycolysis in the cytoplasm. It's the most highly conserved. It's one of the oldest processes. It's just the way, you know, that we, we can make energy. Um, so in fact, all living cells contain enzymes for the glycolytic pathway. So it's split into 10 steps. Um, and these 10 steps, you can subdivide them into two different phases. So the first five steps are known as the preparatory phase and the last five are known as the payoff phase. Um, just because the way, just the flow of energy is working in each of those phases. So in the preparatory phase, we're actually spending a little bit of energy um, for a bigger payoff during that second half payoff phase. So uh, also keep in mind that glycolysis takes place in the cytoplasm. Um, and with both of those in mind, we'll just go through the steps. So during step one, a singular glucose molecule, that's our starting molecule, is going to enter the glycolytic pathway when it is phosphorylated um, into G6P by hexokinase. That just means that we put a, a phosphate group right onto that six carbon of the glucose. Uh, the glucose molecule and the enzyme that is responsible for doing that is hexokinase. So G6P and hexokinase work on a negative feedback loop. An increase in G6P, which is the product, is going to inhibit the activity of the hexokinase. So we start making a lot of product. The enzyme is going to be inhibited. The product starts to get a little bit lower. The enzyme is going to get more active to create more of the product. Uh, G6P is now unable to leave the cell because of the negatively charged phosphate. So that's really um, the main point of adding a phosphate onto the glucose is that it sequesters it inside the cell and it's not able to pass through. 
Um, so G6P is also supplied to the glycolytic pathway by cleaving glycogen. Um, and step one is irreversible. So that's considered uh, one of the committed steps to glycolysis. So uh, as soon as a glucose molecule is phosphorylated with that uh, phosphate group on the sixth carbon, it's pretty much committed to going through glycolysis. Okay, so step two, G6P is converted into F6P, um, and the name of the enzyme is phosphoglucose isomerase, um, and this step converts the molecule into a usable form for the following steps. So we're just uh, taking that six carbon sugar, um, <clears throat> that glucose, and we're turning it into uh, fructose. Uh, fructose. So another phosphate group is added to the F6P molecule uh, via the enzyme phosphofructokinase 1. Um, it's more commonly referred to as PFK1, um, and it produces a molecule called fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. So like this, uh, this step, like step one, is also irreversible. So this would be considered the second committed step of the 10-step process. Um, and it actually uses up one ATP molecule in order to turn um, in order for uh, PFK1 to actually operate and produce fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. Um, so this is referred to as the actual committed step of the entire process because the molecule can no longer be used in any other metabolic pathways like glycogenesis. So when we're at um, <clears throat> step one and we convert it to G6P, there actually are a few other um, sort of different processes that that G6P can undergo besides glycolysis, including the uh, phosphate pentose uh, the pentose phosphate pathway, which we're going to talk about in a little bit as well. But uh, once we get to step three and we convert uh, to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, uh, there's nothing else that this molecule can do except finish glycolysis. So that's why I refer to step three as the committed step. <clears throat> so in step four, fructose 1,6-bisphosphate is cleaved um, by fructose 1,6-bisphosphate aldolase. Um, the names of the enzymes aren't super important. Um, it's just important to sort of follow the general structure of, of what the molecules, what's happening to the molecules in each step. Um, so in this step, we're turning them into two, three carbon sugars. So we're finally breaking those six carbons apart. Um, and we are left with glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, which is also known as GAP, um, and dihydri dihydroxyacetone phosphate, or DHAP. Um, so this step is reversible again, and the remainder of the glycolytic pathway will oxidize three carbon sugars. So GAP can continue to step six, but DHAP will undergo a conversion in step five. So basically, it's just an isomerization. Um, they have the same uh, they have the same atoms, DHAP and uh, GAP, but uh, we just need to convert DHAP using triose phosphate isomerase. So after steps four and five, one glucose molecule has been broken down into two molecules of GAP. Although at equilibrium, the mix is 96% DHAP, the use of GAP in subsequent steps pulls the reaction forward. So DHAP and GAP are going to be in equilibrium with each other, but because we can't use DHAP, the only usable form of the product is uh, that, GAP, that GAP product. Um, it's gonna be pulled into other steps. And because we're lowering that GAP concentration, um, it's actually gonna pull the equilibrium over from DHAP more so to the GAP. So step six is the beginning of the payoff phase. So in this step, we have an enzyme called G3P hydrogenase, and that catalyzes the oxidation of G3P to 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. This is also a reversible reaction. Um, and this is the first step in glycolysis that actually produces a high energy electron carrier, which is NADH. Um, and that's one of those electron carriers that's gonna be really useful for the electron transport chain once we head over. Um, so in step seven, uh, the high energy phosphate on the one carbon of 1,3-BPG is transferred to ADP to create ATP, the uh, phosphoglycerate kinase. Um, so a lot of big words in that one too, but you just have to understand that in step seven, we are creating ATP. So we're taking uh, one of those phosphate groups from 1,3-BPG and we're putting it back onto ADP to create ATP. Um, and we use the help of a kinase, obviously, to do that. So this is gonna yield one ATP, and then um, we're left with a molecule called 3-phosphoglycerate or 3-PG. <clears throat> so step eight, 3-phosphoglycerate is converted into 2-phosphoglycerate by the enzyme phosphoglycerate mutase. Um, so the phosphoryl group on carbon three is removed um, and a phosphoryl group is added to carbon two, hence the name of the product molecule. This step is also reversible. So again, this is sort of just an isomerization. We're moving uh, the phosphate group from the three carbon to the two carbon, um, and it is reversible. So step nine, right after, two phosphoglycerate is dehydrated into phosphoenol pyruvate, um, and it's catalyzed by an enzyme called enolase, which is also um, a reversible reaction, uh, but PEP can now enter the final step of glycolysis. So we finally have that PEP, phosphoenol pyruvate, um, which is a pretty important molecule because we can get over to step 10, 
Um, and then step 10, pyruvate kinase is what catalyzes the conversion of PEP into pyruvate by, create, uh, by transferring, excuse me, its phosphoryl group to ADP to create ATP. So we're just getting rid of that, uh, that phosphate group on pyruvate. Uh, we're transferring it to an ATP. And in doing that, we create pyruvate and um, an ATP molecule. So the product pyruvate is created in its enol form and quickly tautomerizes to the keto form. Um, so this tautomerization pulls the entire reaction forward um, and renders step 10 irreversible once pyruvate is formed. So this is not an equilibrium reaction. Um, it's going to be completely pulled over to uh, pyruvate. Uh, so the two pyruvate molecules formed by glycolysis will head to the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex to be converted into acetyl-CoA before the Krebs cycle. Um, so we could take a look at that also really quickly because that's a pretty important step before we head over to the Krebs cycle because you need that molecule acetyl-CoA in, in order to spin the cycle. Um, so there's a process that we, we need to bridge the gap from pyruvate to acetyl-CoA. So the complex is actually made up of three different enzymes. What we referred to as the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. Um, so there's E1, E2, and E3. Um, so E1 is also known as pyruvate dehydrogenase. E2 is dihydrolipoyl transacetylase. And uh, E3 is dihydrolipoyl dehydrogenase. So after one glucose molecule makes it through the glycolytic pathway, two pyruvate molecules head to the mitochondrial matrix to the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. So remember, we've been in the cytoplasm um, for all of glycolysis. Um, and once it heads to the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, it starts heading over to the mitochondrial matrix. So in the PDC, pyruvate undergoes oxidative decarboxylation. So um, remember what decarboxylation is, it's that um, release of carbon dioxide. Um, so a carbon is released from the three carbon sugar as CO2. Um, and the remaining two carbon entity is attached to a CoA group uh, to form acetyl-CoA, because that remaining two carbon entity, entity is um, an acetyl group. So we attach that to CoA, and that's how we get our molecule acetyl-CoA. Um, so a molecule of NAD plus is also reduced to NADH. So we're in this process, we're also uh, making another NADH, another electron carrier. Um, and PDC is crucially regulated by AMP levels. So AMP levels indicate low energy in the cell and therefore upregulate PDC activity to feed the Krebs cycle. So AMP is what happens when you take two phosphate groups away from ATP. Um, it's adenosine monophosphate. So if there are high AMP levels, that usually corresponds, correlates with uh, low ATP levels. Um, so the cell can use AMP levels to actually detect the level of energy in the cell. So if those AMP levels are low, we're going to upregulate PDC and we're going to um, spin the Krebs cycle. Okay. Um, so this is the first review question. Take a minute, uh, read this, pause the video. Um, I would take no more than a minute. Um, after you unpause, we're just going to go over it really quickly. Okay, at various points in glycolysis, NAD plus is used to oxidize different molecules, which answer best describes what would happen if the body supply of NAD plus was allowed to decrease. So the correct answer is D, um, and let's go over it. So A says, since the main product of glycolysis is pyruvate, its productivity is not affected by NAD plus levels. Um, so that is not true, because remember, we need NAD plus in glycolysis um, because it acts as that oxidizing agent. So it's taking those electrons um, from some of the compounds that we need it to take electrons from. So if we don't have that NAD plus, uh, glycolysis is going to be inhibited. We're not going to be able to reach those final steps uh, because we have nowhere to, to bring those electrons. Um, so A is not correct. B states a decrease in the NAD plus levels would speed up glycolysis as it tries to replenish the levels back to normal. Um, which again is not true. Decrease in the NAD plus levels would severely hinder glycolysis, um, and glycolysis doesn't replenish NAD plus levels. It replenishes NADH levels, um, which is the oxid, which is the uh, reduced form of NAD plus. So B is also incorrect. Um, C glycolysis would slow down because there are no longer enough NADH molecules to act as a reducing agent. Um, that's not true. NADH is a reducing agent, but glycolysis wouldn't slow down because there's no longer enough NADH. Uh, the reason why it's slowing down is because there's, uh, which is D, is because there are no longer enough NAD plus molecules to act as an oxidizing agent. Um, so if we have nothing to oxidize, then we're not really doing anything with the energy um, and glycolysis is going to slow down. So D is the correct answer. Um, if you have any questions about that, feel free to email me. <clears throat> Okay, um, so we're gonna talk about the pentose phosphate pathway and fermentation. There's not too much about it on the MCAT, but it is absolutely fair game. So we're definitely gonna go over it. 
Um, so the pentose phosphate pathway is also known as the PPP or uh, the pentose phos phosphate shunt. Uh, this pathway is essential to nucleic acid synthesis and other anabolic processes. So it's really simple. Basically, we're starting off the same exact way as uh, glycolysis. We have glucose. Um, if you look right over here to the right at this diagram, we're starting with glucose, um, HK, that stands for that hexokinase, that first irreversible step, we create G6P. So if you remember, this next step would be the committed step if we were list, um, if we were following the glycolytic pathway, but there's also another option that can enter the pentose phosphate pathway. So this G6P right here at step two can sort of take a side step into the pentose phosphate pathway if necessary. <clears throat> Um, so the pentose phosphate pathway, there are three important molecules um, that are produced. So NADPH is probably one of the most important ones, um, and it's useful during anabolism. NADPH, if you see that H, you know it's a reduced uh, cofactor. So we have NADH, we also have NADPH. So this is where the majority of NADPH in your body is created. Um, and that molecule is pretty useful during anabolism, specifically with fatty acid synthesis, we see it used. Um, Another product of the phosphate pathway is ribose 5-phosphate, um, which is a uh, phosphorylated sugar that can be used to create nucleotides. Um, any nucleotides that have uh, ribose in their backbone, that's how we create that as well. Um, and then it will also come out with glycolytic intermediates that will feed back into glycolysis. So if we're looking back over here, um, this green and purple phase is the, uh, phosphate, the pentose phosphate pathway. Um, and then we get right over here to the left of this purple, and it's going to feed right back into the glycolytic pathway. <clears throat> and that's really all you need to know about the pentose phosphate pathway. It's just sort of another, um, just sort of like another energetic pathway that we use to create um, important biomolecules like NADPH, ribose 5-phosphate, and glycolytic, uh, just the name of the actual glycolytic intermediates aren't really important, but it's just important to understand that that's why we call this a shunt, um, because we can pull uh, we could pull reactants out of the glycolytic pathway and we can shunt them back in uh, halfway down the line so that we don't, um, so that we don't really, um, we don't really waste anything. Um, so fermentation, there are two types of fermentation. Uh, there's lactic acid fermentation and uh, ethanol fermentation. Um, in humans, it is lactic acid that is the byproduct. So in anaerobic conditions, the electron transport chain and oxidative phosphorylation cannot function properly. So oxygen is the final electron acceptor in the electron transport chain, if you remember. Um, without anywhere for the electrons to go, we see a buildup of NADH and a halt of the ETC. So all of that, um, those high energy electron carriers, all that NADH that we're making from uh, glycolysis on uh, the Krebs cycle, if there's nowhere for it to dump its electrons, um, it's pretty much going to, it's just going to mess up the, the delicate balance of the entire system. So we're going to have a buildup of NADH and we're not going to have any NAD+. Um, so this becomes not only an issue for the electron transport chain, we're not actually performing oxidative phosphorylation anymore, um, <clears throat> but it messes up the preceding steps as well. So the supply of NAD plus has been completely reduced to NADH, glycolysis may be inhibited um, because reduction of NAD plus to NADH is a key step. Um, and acts as an, uh, as an oxidizing agent, a very important oxidizing agent in that process. So if the body could replenish its oxidized NAD plus levels, glycolysis can continue in their anaerobic conditions. Um, so pretty much the most intuitive way that the body thought of replenishing NAD plus levels from NADH is if you don't have oxygen, you just have to find a different uh, final electron acceptor. Um, so that's exactly what the body does. And it turns out that that electron acceptor is actually pyruvate. So during fermentation, the body finds another electron acceptor. When pyruvate receives electrons, NADH is oxidized to NAD+, so we have that reduced NADH form. Instead of giving it to oxygen like it usually does during the electron transport chain, um, if there is no oxygen present in the environment, it will donate its electrons to pyruvate, um, and that's how it's going to regenerate that oxidized form of NAD+, um, and pyruvate is reduced to lactic acid. Um, so in certain organisms, like yeast, pyruvate is reduced to ethanol instead of lactic acid, um, so those are the two main forms of fermentation, but that is really um, fermentation's goal. It's not necessarily to create ATP, but it's to replenish um, those NAD plus, uh, those NAD plus molecules so that we can get through glycolysis and we can create ATP in other ways. Um, ethanol and lactic acid are toxic at high concentrations, so fermentation has a limit. Um, it's not something that should be performed in ideal conditions, um, and it's not something that's performed in ideal conditions.
Um, however, that buildup of lactic acid, our body has figured out um, sort of a clever way to recycle it and create energy from um, that lactic acid. And that's uh, what we refer to as the Cori cycle. So the Cori cycle is a way for the body to reuse the lactic acid created during fermentation. So when oxygen supplies return to normal and we finally have oxygen back into the blood, oxygen supplied uh, to our muscles, the body is also going to start replenishing its NAD plus, right? So as we have uh, those NADH, um, those reducing agents, um, we finally have oxygen uh, for those uh, electrons to be given to. So we're finally turning all that NADH uh, back into NAD plus, um, and the ETC is going to return to normal functioning. So um, as it returns to normal function, your body is trying to get rid of lactic acid. So it's going to send it to um, the liver, which is, you know, the part of your body that takes care of uh, purification of toxins throughout, um, throughout your blood. So it's pretty intuitive that it would end up in the liver. Um, and during the quarry cycle, lactate is oxidized back into pyruvate. So we're just taking the lactate. Um, we are taking the electrons away from it. We're turning it back into pyruvate. Um, and we're creating more NADH because remember that balance between NAD plus and NADH has been restored again. Um, so if the electron transport chain is working regularly, then it would be a good thing that we're trying to pre, uh, produce more NADH. So <clears throat> we're just taking those electrons away from lactate, putting them back on NAD plus. So we now have pyruvate and NADH, which are two useful molecules. Um, and we can use those for the electron transport chain. So the pyruvate that can then enter gluconeogenesis, it can turn into glucose again. Um, it can enter the Krebs cycle. If it goes to, um, if we turn it into acetyl-CoA, it can enter the Krebs cycle and spin there, um, or it can be sent back into the muscles. Um, so there's a couple of things we can do uh, with that pyruvate, um, but it's just important to know that the lactic acid, although it's considered a byproduct um, for anaerobic fermentation, um, it actually does get repurposed once it goes into the liver, and that process is known as the Cori cycle. Okay, and this brings us to our last review question. Um, so again, take a minute, read it over, and we will go over it. So which of the following molecules is or are involved in fermentation? We have Roman numerals one through four, and then our choice is A through E. So the correct answer is D. Um, this is a pretty simple question. Uh, you basically, I mean, you don't really even have to have extensive knowledge of fermentation to know um, which of the following molecules is or are involved in fermentation. Uh, one is fructose, which I think the only time I mentioned fructose was probably in the beginning glycolysis. So it's not really important for fermentation, um, but pyruvate definitely is, lactate definitely is, um, and ethanol is as well. Because remember, we have lactic acid fermentation, lactate and lactic acid are basically the same thing. Um, and we also have ethanol fermentation. So those two um, definitely are involved. And then pyruvate, um, of course, is involved as well. So the only one that's not is one, fructose. So that would make D, two, three, and four the correct answer, um, and A, B, and, C, and E incorrect. Okay, that's all I have for today. Um, that's my email right there, ChristopherSkegnelli1 at gmail.com. If you have any questions about today, any questions um, about you know, some of the material, you want any clarification, um, any questions about our office hours, or you wanna be added to our group me, uh, please don't hesitate to shoot me an email. I will try to answer you as quickly as possible. Um, other than that, we are finished for today and I will see you guys next week.